October cluster in 1933. And then another paper that came rather later by Kahn and Vulture on the timing mass for the M31 galaxy system. And again, this, this is a really important and very direct um, indication that there is dark matter. And, but it, it really got very little response. And then I want to contrast this very briefly with the discovery of pulsars and the discovery of dark matter in the toroidal galaxies, both of which had an immediate impact. And then I'm going to turn to Slipher's work on um, galaxy redshift. So first of all, Twiggy's discovery of dark matter in coma. Well, he measured the velocity dispersion of galaxies in the coma cluster. He used techniques that are the same as what we use now, the Brutal Theorem, to show that the mass of the coma cluster was much in excess of the likely sum of the masses of the individual galaxies. A similar result came from Sinclair Smith a few years later in the Virgo cluster. And Twiggy's velocity dispersion, I should add, and, and, so, and Smith's also are close to present estimates for the cluster. So there's no problem with this, with the data. This profound discovery but little response other than Smith's follow-up study. It took another 35 years for the dark matter saga to take off. And in this case, Twiggy in the end did get the credit. Then it took another 20 years to learn that clusters have the universal baryon content, about 16% of their mass, including hot gas, which dominates the baryons. And the rest of the basically, cluster is in dark matter, partly in the galaxies and partly in the, in the clusters. I'll just take a moment just to show you some pictures that are probably pretty familiar. This is two examples of clusters which are moving there's two clusters involved in each case. They're moving in the plane of the screen. They have an encounter. And what you can see in the blue is the dark matter, um, which is associated with the galaxies. And that dark matter is mapped out by weak lensing. And then you can see in red the hot gas, which is seen in, in, in X-rays and measured by the Chandra, um, Chandra telescope. So you, you can really see how the dark matter content lies. And this is just really to indicate what sort of follows on from uh, Twiggy's, uh, Twiggy's work. Why did this profound and apparently straightforward discovery get so little response? Did the community already regard Twiggy with suspicion, suspicion or did that just come later? Why, why didn't the astronomers follow up in, I think, what would be a pretty obvious thing to do, even at the, even at the time, with spectroscopy of groups of galaxies like the M81 and LEO, which do, these are just like smaller, smaller clusters, which would in fact be much easier to study than what Twiggy achieved in coma? Or was it due to suspicion of results for which there's no existing theoretical framework? I suspect this is a, a big part of it. It'll just come up again several times in the talk. For example, Eddington's uh, quote that it's also a good rule not to put over much confidence in observational results until they're confirmed by theory. <laughs> this overweening arrogance of theoreticians that we still have <laughs> Okay, well, Twiggy now does get full credit for his discovery. And it's a counterexample to Stiegler's law of eponymy that no scientific discovery is named after its original discovery. Um, new big ideas only tend to catch on when the scientific community is ready for them or an established scientist find them useful, and I think we've all seen this happen. And particularly, if a statement of an idea comes too early and a later statement is accepted by the community, it indicates that the community accepts ideas when they fit into their current framework. And this is something we, we see all the time, that there's no virtue in being ahead of your time. If you make a discovery and it's too early, you're regarded as best as a freak when finally the community catches up with it. At worst, you're, you're, you're completely disregarded. And it's, 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 it's just a fact of life. Yeah. Okay, I don't want to dwell too much on the appropriation of discoveries by others or the later failure to recognize discoveries by slightness. That, need not be the same issue as, as Stigler's law. But Hubble's name <coughs> comes up frequently in these discussions, see um, Michael's talk on, on Saturday. It's interesting to ask why. I'm, interest, I'm aware of at least four examples of this kind of thing involving Hubble. Well, there are two that we're, we're familiar with at this meeting. One is the lack of recognition of slightest redshift achievements until long after the event. His work had impact on the community at the time, but later it didn't get the recognition that it deserved in the context of the expanding universe. And then there's the issue about the Hubble redshift distance law and the matrix contribution, which has been discussed a lot recently. The matrix discovery of the law a few early years earlier than, than Hubble's wasn't recognized properly. 
a translation of La Nature's paper into English, omitted. This was a, a, a largely theoretical paper with little observational uh, results in it. A translation of Lavatra's paper into English omitted the observational section, which showed the Hubble's law and uh, which showed the Hubble law and Lavatra's derivation of the Hubble constant. And there's been quite a bit, of, uh, a bit of correspondence in the last couple of years about this and whether it was dirty work put. But Murray Olivio has argued, and I think fairly convincingly, that this omission was in fact Lavatra's choice. And this sometimes happens when you get theoreticians who are involved in also some observational work. They see that the theoretical work is much more important than the observational work. And I can easily, having been in a situation like this myself, from the days when I was a theoretician, um, I, I can easily see how Lavatra may have thought that his observational contribution really wasn't nearly as significant as the theoretical one and just expunged it from the translation. But anyway, this this is something about which has been quite a bit of work recently. In the book, in the book that Owen mentioned that uh, David Block and I wrote a few years ago, we identified two other incidents involving Hubble and the UK astronomer Reynolds. Reynolds was an interesting character. He was a so-called amateur, but in fact, he was no more amateur than most of the astronomers in this room. He, had a, he, he was a very professional operator. He knew a huge amount of astronomy, had a lot of money. He was a, an industrialist. Um, and he bought it, and he had a lot of measuring equipment for analyzing photographic plates. He built three 30 inch telescopes, one of which finished up in Australia and unfortunately destroyed in the fire. But these were, these were fine telescopes. He did a lot of photography and he got quantitative results out of photography, which is quite a feat even, even in the present days. So Reynolds basically invented the thing that's now called the Hubble classification of galaxies. Hubble certainly knew about Reynolds' work. And the two of them corresponded about classification around 1919. The other Hubble law, not the expansion of the universe, but the light distribution in elliptical galaxies, which looks like this. That's a certain brightness distribution, r is a radius, a is a scale. Reynolds discovered this uh, several years before Hubble actually worked on it. It became known as the Hubble distribution, but more recently it's been people have figured out that Reynolds actually did this first. And it's now known as the as the Hubble, <coughs> Hubble Reynolds Law. There's a view that Hubble wasn't generous in acknowledging the contribution of others. Um, some who I knew who themselves knew Hubble regarded him poorly in this respect. On the other hand, um, Hubble is not unique in this kind of behavior. Uh, some of us are careless about picking up ideas and forgetting where they came from. It still happens today. There's a whole bunch of other things that come into it geography, institutional rivalry, culture, national cultures can also be significant elements in this behavior. Brothers, I suspect Spiker is one of them, and certainly Reynolds was another one. Uh, modesty is more important than um, credit. I, I, I won't go on about this any longer. Now, the, the other example of an important discovery that got almost no, made almost no impact at the time is the work by Kahneman and Bolcher on the motion of M31 relative to the galaxy. M31 is about 750 kiloparsecs from us. It's approaching the Milky Way at 188 kilometers a second. Now, if you adopt the age of the universe, assume a radial orbit, and just simple Keplerian dynamics, it shows immediately that the mass of the system M31 in the Milky Way is about 20 times larger than the likely masses of the stars. And this was well known at the time. A large, uh, I say here, we assume a radial orbit, if you, a large transverse component of the motion is unlikely and was recently shown to be small, would, would anyway make the problem worse rather than better. So Carter Vulture got a total mass for the two galaxies of, that was greater than 2 by 10 to the 10, 10 to the 12 solar masses. Recent estimates, very recent estimates, about 3 times 10 to the 12. The distance scale was right and the stellar masses were going to be right. Their argument is direct and compelling, but in 1959 it made almost no impact. It was brushed off by a couple of unconvincing studies that concluded that extra mass wasn't needed to bind the local group. So here's, here's the picture of just the two galaxies approaching at 180 kilometers a second, do the Keplerian dynamics, and you finish up with a ratio of dark to stellar mass of around 20. So you know what the stellar masses that involved are, and this means you've got a, a dark halo going out to way past 
So counterculture excluded intergalactic stars, and they argued that the extra required mass was in the form of ionized gas. And the paper went on to ex explore the effect that this gas might have on the galactic disk. And maybe that was a distraction from the real impact of the paper, that there was a, there was a huge amount of unaccounted for matter. Why did the paper have so little impact? Well, the argument is simple and it's correct, and it's survived to the present. They were both very respectable and well regarded researchers. And if their work had made the impact it deserves, it could have started the dark matter revival in 1959 instead of waiting another decade. And my guess is that there was simply no theoretical framework within which to interpret this observation. The weak, contrary evidence that I mentioned <coughs> provided the welcome escape from an uncomfortable situation. Now, in the 1970s, the, this revival that I mentioned here, that started and it came from 21 centimetre rotation curves of spiral galaxies, and that showed very clearly that they had massive and extended dark halos. The argument was really no clearer than Carl and Volcher's argument, but it did make an impact. And the reason it made an impact was that there was a theoretical framework at that point for discussing dark matter, even though this theoretical framework turns out to be wrong. So this, this is what I'm talking about, the, the 21 centimetre rotation curve of a particular spiral that's been well studied. This is how the rotation goes with radius. This is what you expect from the stars and the gas together, this one. And you need an extra contribution that looks like this in rotation against radius from a dark halo to give you the rotation curve you observe. And now, by now, hundreds of galaxies have been observed in this way. It's quite clear that the stars and the gas together don't provide enough gravity to explain the rotation. You need the extra gravity of the dark halo. So the Carlton Vulture story about the galaxy in M31 is dynamically very straightforward. And so is the dynamics of the flat rotation curves. One of these made an impact, and the other one did not. The idea of dark matter from rotation curves started controversially around 1970s. This is a typical, you know, it's Scott Tremaine has discussed this in terms of par paradigm changes. It was a typical sort of paradigm change. It was, it was, oh, oops, sorry. It was controversial when it started, um, but it, it was based on poor data, but it was taken seriously. So why was it taken seriously? Well, I think the reason is that in the 1970s, the idea of the massive dark halo got unexpected support from theoretical arguments about the need of, for dark matter to stabilize disks against star formation. Now these arguments turned out to be irrelevant because <coughs> in fact most galaxies do have bars. In fact, now we know that dark halos are needed to sustain bars by angular momentum transport. But anyway, there was this theoretical framework in which people could, could interpret what was going on with this dark matter, so pretty much a dark matter revolution. Mm -hmm. kind of the prophecy <coughs> ended around 1978 when high poles and 21 centimeter curves became available from the Dutch uh, radio telescope. Even though the theory turned out to be irrelevant, people believe observations that fit into a theoretical framework, even if the observations have a sounder basis than the theory, as of course is the case here. It allows them to come to grips with startling observa uh, observations in the way we're getting so here's just to show you what bounce spirals are all about in case you, you forgot. Here's an unbarred spiral, basically a symmetric system. A barred spiral. In the 1970s, barred spirals were thought to be rare. Now we know that in fact they're very common. Most galaxies, including our own galaxy, have a central bar when you look at them in the infrared. And here's just a quick picture of the spiral galaxy M83. First of all, in blue light, and then in, in the K band in the infrared. In the infrared, the blue stars are not so important, and all this dust absorption becomes uh, transparent. You can see very clearly a bar in this galaxy, which you don't see immediately in the optical picture. Okay, so just very quickly, a couple of unexpected, uh, couple of unexpected discoveries that had an immediate impact. One was the discovery of pulsars in 1967 by Hewish and Bell. That was followed by a quick stream of papers after a very brief uh, episode that some of you might remember about little green men sending the signals. The focus very quickly moved to the current spinning neutron star explanation. Why did this get such a quick response? Because the basic theoretical framework was already in place from Barbara Twicky and other theoretical developments. People very quickly made the connection 
between pulsars and spinning neutron stars. Another example is the discovery of the high fraction of dark matter in the Walsh galaxies. And this started in 1983 with two papers of quite different arguments. This was to do with the tidal structure of these galaxies. This one was to do with the velocity dispersion based on three stars. In both cases, the arguments were really flimsy, but there was only limited skepticism. Now, this dark matter in dwarf spheroidals is still a very active field today. Current estimates of mass to light ratios are over a thousand for some of the papers of these dwarf spheroidal galaxies. Why did this discovery get such a quick response? Again, in this case, I think it was because the basic observational infrastructure of dark matter in galaxies was already there, plus the ideas from White and Reese. 1978 about the importance of dark matter in galaxy formation. Okay, so now, now the slide you've, you've already eaten it as, as, <coughs> as early as this in the conference. You've, you've, you've heard much of this, so I can go through a lot of this quite quickly. Slide had expert, expertise in spectroscopy. He wrote uh, a very nice paper on the Lowell spectrograph uh, that was built for planetary spectroscopy to go on the 61 centimeter refractor. Lowell had requested <coughs> slide to get uh, spectra of these nebulae, but not in the context of extragalactic sites, of course. This was a major challenge because of their low surface brightness. Slifer had the expertise, or acquired the expertise, to do this kind of thing. He modified the instrument for nebular spectroscopy, and you probably saw last night the modification to the spectrograph that he used to do this. This advanced the technology, made it possible to measure nebular redshifts, although, as, um, as Laird mentioned in question time earlier, he wasn't really the first person to, to get into nebulous spectroscopy. But for about a decade, Slifer was the only person, almost the only person, measuring velocities of nebulae, although there are mentions of confirmations by Wright, Wolf, and, and Peace. These people, and Fat from Lick, have already acquired <coughs> nebulous spectroscopy, nebulous spectra, but for ver various reasons have not measured uh, their radial velocities. So here's the picture you've seen already a few times. Slifer at the spectrograph, just a few uh, technical things. Nebular exposures were long, uh, 20 to 40 hours. The linear dispersions of this instrument were, was, was not, it was not particularly low by nebular spectrograph standards. It was 140 tenth meters per millimeter. Now, I never heard of tenth meters until I started preparing this talk. But a tenth meter is an, is an answer in case you're like me and you don't know. This, for people like me who've done the nebular spectroscopy in the past, is quite adequate to see visually um, rotation in, in, a, in, a, in a spiral galaxy. With the original optics, uh, just for contrast, the dispersion was about 11 angstroms per millimeter, or a resolution of 22,000, which is at the sort of low end of what we would now call high resolution spectroscopy. So the slide of papers, again, you, you, you've heard much of this, the measurement of M31, and this quote from him that this measuring Velocities of nebulae is something worth doing. 1914, he measured the rotation of the Sombrero galaxy. This is a system with a high surface brightness bulge, and that's probably why he was able to do it. Quite high rotational velocity. This would be easily visible just with the naked eye on the photographic spectrum. 1915, he had 15, he had velocities of 15 spirals. 13 of them were positive up to 1,100 kilometers a second. Mean was about 400 kilometers a second. And this is the important point that Slifer very much realized immediately. This is about 25 times higher than the average stellar velocity. By 1917, he did this uh, longer review um, on, on the nebulae. Um, how accurate are his velocities? They're actually pretty good. The dispersion against modern values is 112 kilometers a second, which is very close to his own estimate of about 100 kilometers a second. So by 1917, he had 25 galaxies up to 1,100 kilometers a second, all positive except for the local group and M81. The mean velocity of the nebulae is now about 30 times the average velocity of the stars. And Slifer really appreciated this very much himself. For a long time, he said, it's been suggested that spiral nebulae are stellar systems seen at great distances. This is the island universe theory. And this theory, it seems to me, gains favor in the present observations. So Slifer was very well aware of the implications and significance of his observations. The velocities are much greater than those of galactic stars. He inferred that the objects lie outside the Milky Way. Hertzsprung had written to him in 1914 to make exactly the same point. And although there were a few, like the Reynolds 
that I've mentioned before, had their doubt about the, sli about the date of slight matter convincing response with confirmation of velocities from others. His work was well known. Why didn't it settle the issue of the island universes? The velocities of stars were known from the work of uh, Boss and Campbell and Capain and others to increase the spiral, the spiral the spectral type as we've, as we've heard from, uh, from, uh, from Robert, uh, from about six kilometers a second at early types up to 27 kilometers a second for the planetary nebula. And this, I should just add that this effect of why this happens is still today not understood what the heating process is that drives the dispersion of stars up as they get effectively getting older and it's still left behind. That heating is really not, not understood here. So the question is, could could these galactic objects with their high velocities, three or four hundred kilometers a second, be just simply further up this evolutionary chain? It seemed unlikely. I think Slipher regarded it as unlikely. Their high velocities indicated that they weren't gravitationally bound to the Milky Way. That's a simple argument which people had the equipment from what Captain had done to work out that the galaxies were just, if they were physically, un dynamically unbound to the Milky Way. By 1916, there were already some ideas about obscuring material in the Milky Way. It had been, been long known, back into the 19th century, that the nebula avoided the galactic plane, which had gained favor but interpretation, putting them outside the Milky Way at the time. Further observations came from the observations of the galactic nobi, but the thing that really confused the issues was von Neumann's uh, proclamation from nearby galaxies. This, I think, is, I, 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 I speculate in the end that this is really at the root why Slipher missed out on some of his credit. So in the 1920s Shapley Curtis debate, Shapley argued that the nebulae are just nearby clouds and the universe is one big galaxy. Curtis argued that the nebulae are galaxies like our own, far outside the Milky Way. In the end, Hubble's 1923 separate work on M31 settled the question. But there's some similarity um, of this controversy about the island universe the dark matter controversy that I talked about in the 1970s. There's a similarity in reverse. The dark matter story was supported by erroneous theories, while the island universe was delayed by the erroneous observations. And I think the point we learned from this is that <coughs> the progress is not always linear. I conclude that Slipher's situation is not at all comparable with Swift's. Slipher's work made an impact at the time, but his problems with recognition came later. It was, of course, Swifties was exactly the opposite way around. I'd speculate that without the Marmon's confusion, this issue would have been more clearly defined. Maybe the debate would not have happened, and Slipher would have got the credit for identifying the nebulae as extra black, which I think he deserves. So, my last slide, in conclusion, I still find it hard, after reading more about this, I still find it hard to believe that the high velocities of the nebulae were not regarded as Inclusive evidence for the extragalactic nature. Slipher had shown convincingly that the wavelength shift in the spectra of the nebulae were consistent with the Doppler shift, and others had reproduced these velocities. Captain had already made a fairly accurate estimate of the mass of the Milky Way and seemed clear, even at this time, that the nebulae could not be bound to the Milky Way. So I think Slipher was very unfortunate in missing out on this. <coughs> Stay here and answer <laughs> some questions. Uh, that quotation from Eddington, uh, Cecilia Payne Kapashkin said how startled she was when Eddington said he wouldn't believe an observation if, unless it had a good theory behind it. And she asked him why in the world he had said something like that. And he said, Oh, I just wanted to shake up Rutherford. She <laughs> <laughs> yeah. has some questions in the back. Could you say a little more about what von Neumann's observations, erroneous observations, were? Yeah, sure. Uh, von Neumann had used photographic observations separated by some length of time to look for the transverse motion of objects in M101 and I think also in M31. And he has found an effect. This is a, it's a very subtle, uh, measuring proper motions even for stars is, is quite a subtle thing. A lot of things can go wrong, and a lot of things did go wrong. And by 1925, I think his, his work was discredited. I, I, I 
can't really go into the technicalities of this. I'm not sure exactly what went wrong. I, I, I suspect I, I suspect I know because just of the way that he made the comparison of where stars were in one epoch and where they were in another epoch. But anyway, he had some respectability and he was taken very taken very seriously. But then in, in the end, a few years later, this work turned out to be wrong. It came at just the wrong time for the debate, the Curtis Shapley debate, and certainly for Slifer. I think if this phenomenon thing hadn't happened, the evolution of this whole thing may well have been different. Hale may not have even wanted to stage this debate at the, um, at, at the Academy, and I think history could have been quite different. But I, I, I thought I'd also read that uh, <coughs> when Hubble made his discovery of the Cepheid and Andromeda, that he he was at the same institute as Von Manen, and Von Manen had these crazy plates, and he, he drove him crazy that this guy was saying that what he had discovered wasn't possible because of this exact problem. So are you sure it was 1925 he was already discredited? Because Hubble was quite concerned about it in what I've read. <coughs> so, and that, that 1925 may have, been, may have been a bit generous. I mean, really, by the time Hubble had done his thing in 1923, the story was over, but I think it was still, there must have still been some worry. Be able to say more on this, but it was a, uh, it, it was still, uh, I mean, my, my sense of it is by 1925, the man was really out of it. You're next. Uh, thank you, Ken. Um, surely part of it, though, is again, it's a, it's, a it's a reluctance to accept that these are Doppler shifts and they are representing radial velocities. I, I think that there's a reluctance there, and I can understand it. You, you gave the answer yourself. It's because there's no explanation for that. Why would they be rushing away? You know, in a Newtonian universe, which it is at this stage for most people, you know, there's no underlying explanation. And so I think it's perfectly normal for a lot of people to assume that maybe these aren't what they look like. Maybe it's some other effect, peculiar motions or whatever else that people say. Yes. Uh, what age of the universe did Kahn and Walter use? It was, it was a bit longer, but the present, I, like I think... 17 billion years? My, my recollection is, is 18, but in, it, it doesn't make a hell of a lot of difference. Joe? Could you say when Captain estimated the mass of the system of stars and how well accepted that estimate was? Um, it, it must have been just somewhere... It, it, it was around the time that Captain was, was basing his, his great model. Uh, so I think... I, I, I may be wrong, but I, I think that was around 1905. But some, somebody may, may could correct me on this. Um, I think it was pretty well accepted because I mean, I, 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 I've never heard of anyone equivalent with it. And it, it was a, it's, it's a very reasonable Newtonian estimate, just basically based on the, on the mass on the motions of the stars at the time. So, oh, okay. Captain never accepted the existence of uh, interstellar absorption when he made some of those calculations. And of course, after Shapley, uh, galaxy turned out to be so much larger. You have to uh, factor that in uh, to the uh, to your third conclusion. Yeah. Uh, that that's, that certainly was a game changer. Yes. Okay. One less last question. Well, from the sublime to the ridiculous. Fill me in on the little green men. Okay. <laughs> I, I was around Cambridge at the time when this was all breaking, and they thought for just for a moment that these were signals from uh, extra, extraterrestrial civilization. But I don't know if this was ever taken seriously. I, I recall seeing this in press, but I couldn't find it um, when I was looking. But I, 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 rem I remember the buzz going around Cambridge that this was this was the hot thing. But it, 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 it really only lasted weeks. <laughs> Led to the timing of the great debate, it clearly wasn't a, a watershed in observation. Well, the timing of the great debate was that uh, relativity was such a big issue at that time, and the uh, academy was much too conservative to hear anything of that. So they figured they could have a nice debate between Mount Wilson and Lake Observatory, and uh, that came about in 1920 uh, as sort of an after-dinner conversation <laughs> at the Academy. All right, thank you.